Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Louis Romano. He's an author. He's written lots of books about the mafia. He's even wrote a book with Gene Borello and John A. Light. In today's video, Lewis talks about meeting a lot of mobsters in his time. The ones that stood out to me was Carlo Giambino and Carmine Tremonti. Lewis played a joke on Carmine Tremonti. You're going to want to hear this. Today we also talk about Lucky Luciano and Albert Anastasia. So please hit subscribe if you want to get more interesting interviews like this. And without further ado, we're going to get into Lewis's story. Hi everybody, I'm Lewis Romano. I am an author. I've uh, written about, well, I've just finished my 20th novel. Uh, mostly about uh, mob stuff, uh, some real true crime mob stuff, uh, mostly fiction. And uh, I also have written uh, a serial killer series. So I don't write about uh, love stories and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Um, so how did you, uh, you know, kind of become, you know, familiar with this, uh, you know, life of crime and stuff like that? Well, I grew up in the Bronx and my father's family had, restaurants in the Bronx and Manhattan and uh, on Arthur Avenue, which is a hub of the Italian community up there in the Bronx, still is to some degree, although not many Italians live there anymore. Uh, but um, I was always around uh, some of the greatest names you could imagine. Uh, I remember Carlo Gambino coming into the restaurant. You wouldn't even know that he was a, the, the, a mob guy. I mean, he, he just walked in like an old man. Uh, with his hat on and a pretty big nose and he'd eat his pasta vazool and, and, and leave. And everybody knew he was there, but no one said a thing to him uh, except respect. Uh, my grandfather waited tables on them, on a lot of the top mob guys in the Bronx. And I'd just been around it my whole life. And that's where I get that penchant for writing uh, about the mob, about, uh, well, of, of late, about the Albanian mob and the Italian mob. Uh, mostly fiction, but fiction that derived from actual events that happened. Right. Uh, the yeah. names are all changed to protect the guilty. Uh, and uh, that's how I got into it. I mean, um, I was never, uh, I was always around it, but never a part of it. I was never a made guy. One guy, uh, a capo under, under John Gotti, older man, he just passed away. He said to me, uh, Louis, because they call me Louis, Louis, uh, you know so many people and everybody respects you and you're a well-known writer. How come you never got in the life? And I looked at him dead in the eyes. He had these big blue eyes. And I said, Louis, his name is Louis also. I don't like your retirement program. And, and, and he laughed and he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I could respect that. I could respect that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's not a life that um, I would uh, prefer to be in or prefer to, uh, have my children or grandchildren in. Uh, it's a treacherous life. The, 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 the life itself is a treacherous life. And I see that mostly when I wrote the, the Gene Borello book, uh, Born in the Life is the name of the book, and uh, the, the John A. Light book. Uh, you know, I know I'm talking about two guys who ratted out guys, and my, uh, my world was not about that. You couldn't tell on anything. You just didn't know. Um, also, my family is from Sicily, and we had a, a long history uh, with uh, Il Mato Nero, the Black Hand, in Sicily. Okay. Um, so what was, uh, you know, what kind of, were you guys around some other major mob guys back in the day or anything or in, encounters oh, yeah. with your family? Oh, well, I could tell you back in Sicily, uh, my grandfather and my, gra my great-grandparents came from a town called La Cara Fridi. And there are two famous people that are from that town. Uh, the, the Sinatra family, Frank Sinatra's family. Uh, his father um, uh, was born there. And another guy named Salvatore Lucania. And any mob people who, are, who know anything about the mob know that his name here in this country was Lucky Luciano. And my family knew the uh, Lucanias. I could tell you they were abracciante. They were people that worked with their arms. They were hardworking peasants. Uh, they came over just uh, uh, at the turn of the century. My grandfather was here in 1891. Um, and uh, Lucania, uh, Lucky Luciano, uh, his family were not bad people. I'm in touch with relatives of his when I go back to the town. Um, I also wrote a book about that called Carusi, The Shame of Sicily, which is not a mob. Well, there is mob influence in the book. Uh, but it's about the little boys in Sicily that were 
forced to be minors at very young age and lived under terrible, terrible conditions. Um, actually, Sinatra's grandfather was in it, and Lucania's, uh, uh, Lucky Luciano's father was in the mines, which was the number one uh, source of income in that small little town. Uh, so we were always exposed to that. We knew who was who, uh, and we just stayed away from, my family stayed away from that. Uh, my father was not Sicilian, but it seems like uh, he had criminals in his family. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side and his, and his uncle uh, were criminals. The Sicilians were all <laughs> plumbers and hard workers. That's funny. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been around a lot of the guys. I grew up uh, in the neighborhoods and um, knew who was who, showed the respect, uh, wouldn't cross over the line. But I have to tell you, Adrian, and I'm talking about the 1950s now. Those were the days of Albert Anastasia, uh, okay? And, uh, well, Maya Lansky was still alive. Uh, Luciano was still alive, but he was, he was back in, in Naples, in, in Italy. Um, those guys, they, they ran the neighborhoods, not only in the Bronx, but in Brooklyn, Queens, anywhere, Manhattan. They ran the neighborhoods like their grandmothers lived there, and their grandmothers did live there. And there was a fine line we didn't need police. I could tell you on Arthur Avenue, that it was the, one of the lowest crime rates, well, reported crime rates uh, in, in the country because these guys ruled with an iron fist. If you did something wrong, you were going to get your head cracked open. Uh, everybody saw the Bronx tale, and Chaz is a great guy. I, I've met Chaz and had lunch with him. Uh, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, he'll tell you the same thing. He stayed away from that element and went into the arts. I went into a different art. I'm a little younger than he is, although he denies that, but <laughs> I'm 71. I'll be 72 in December, and I know he's older, but he denies that. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful person. His whole family is. And um, he'll tell you the same thing. Stay away from these guys because this, it's either life or, or, or death or jail. That's the outcome. And what was, uh, you know, with, you know, Lucky Luciano and, you know, Meyer Lansky and Anastasia, like what is – an example, you know, that you could give that they did, you know, each one of them, if you can, you know, that was that they protected the neighborhood or something different. Well, um, Maya Lansky, not so much. That was lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, he was really the money guy and, and he took off uh, the, the biggest the biggest uh, mob uh, figure in the history of the mafia, American mafia. And maybe the Sicilian mafia, if you put it, that into it, was Lucky Luciano. I mean, Charlie Luciano was the number one guy uh, and feared until the day he died. And he didn't die so well. He didn't he didn't die very f flush with money, as people thought. Uh, Meyer Lansky, they never found his money. Uh, honestly, his son, uh, who I'm in touch with his grandson, his son uh, was uh, he had a birth defect. He was crippled and he wound up living basically living uh, as a ward of the state instead of his father's mass, mass uh, amounts of, of, of money. His money was never found. I talk to people that say that his money was uh, divvied up by the, by the families, uh, but no one, will, no one will come out and say that uh, as a matter of fact because they don't know, um, but that's what it seems to be. Uh, Albert Anastasia, I mean, he was a Brooklyn guy. Um, I never met him. Uh, but I can tell you that he was the Mad Hatter. He was, he was the, probably the biggest killer in the history of the mob. He and v Vito Genovese. Uh, but but uh, they, the neighborhoods, if something happened to somebody, if someone was disrespected, for example, if a woman was disrespected in the street, they took care of it. I mean, we, we, as a boy, now I don't know where you live, but you, you ever see these stores that have all these greats? Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And they have to lock them, and that's all. Uh, and that 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 started happening in the in the late sixties. Uh, our family restaurant on on 187th Street, they didn't have they had a lock on a door that if you kicked the door, it would have opened. And really? there, there wasn't a spoon missing out of that restaurant in forty years. Wow. I mean, no, I'm I'm not kidding you. I mean, I remember, and it's in Different one of times. my it's in one of my books. Um, they used to have uh, regular Saturday mob meetings in the restaurant at about 10 o'clock in the morning. I used to get there with my father at, at about 
eight thirty, nine o'clock. I was 10 years old, 12 years old uh, to sell pizza outside of the restaurant. And they would come up one at a time. Uh, names that you would know uh, from all the families and they would meet in that restaurant. Uh, and I would stand outside with a lemon ice on a stool, basically protecting them from anybody blowing the place up. They all had bodyguards, but they didn't come into the restaurant. They dropped them off in these big cars, mostly Cadillacs and Lincolns. And one guy had a Rolls Royce. Uh, his name was... I could use his name, but I have forgotten it now. He, <laughs> he, he, was, a, he was a plastic surgeon, too, but he was a, a neighborhood guy. Uh, his father's name will come to me in a minute. But uh, they would come in there. They would all, some would give me a quarter, 10 cents, a dollar, and they'd go inside. They would chain the inside of their restaurant door shut. Now, if I had to take a leak, they gave me a can of Italian coffee, an empty can of Italian coffee to pee in. I mean, I'm serious. Uh, it didn't last for more than an hour, mm -hmm. uh, the restaurant. They, and and I, I could recall they had a brick oven uh, on the, in, in the back right side of the restaurant. And uh, they had the best pizza in the history of pizza. And uh, they used to have these spaghetti with, with uh, fish, but it was mostly lobsters in the oven. Imagine what that must taste like. And they would all leave one at a time. The cars would pull up like out of the blue. And these guys were all natally dressed, very well dressed, uh, suits and ties would exit, get in their cars and go away. And then meeting was finished. Um, and that <laughs> went on for quite a long time. Yeah. So you're definitely around it for quite a while. Oh, man. From, what, from a child. Yeah. So what was um, some of the, you know, do you know of any wars that w went on or were you? Had knowledge of any well, of this I, happening? I, I knew of some hits. Uh, okay. The wars were mostly in Brooklyn, and I'm not from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, and and I know I know about them because I've read about them. But where I was, no, there were there was not many turf wars. It was a secession of of mob leaders, uh, and there's still one or two guys left in the neighborhood. Can't mention names um, because I see them from time to time, and. Uh, they try to keep the neighborhood good, but the neighborhood's changing. It's mostly, uh, well, the Albanians are terrific people. They're keeping the neighborhood pretty strong, uh, but it's not like it was. At night, it's quite dangerous in the area. But during the day, it's fine because the restaurants are all there and there's commerce and there's plenty of money. And the only thing that's going to keep that neighborhood, Arthur Avenue and 187th Street, uh, is money. That's all that's going to keep it going. But I see changes every day. I'm there once a week. I see, I see my friends. I go and say hello to the old guys. Right. And, um, and they, they know what I do. I write the books. I don't mention any names. <clears throat> I wrote a book called Bessa, B-E-S-A, which is about the Albanian, a fictitious Albanian uh, group of bad guys going against the Michelli family, who is, uh, the name really should have been Gambino, but I didn't want to put the Gambino name in there. So I called it my mother's maiden name, mm -hmm. the Michelli family. And uh, there's some parallels between some of the people that are active today, but uh, nothing that could incriminate anybody. Right. No, that's good. You never want to do that. Well, you know? I want to walk yeah. around a little bit. I got a few more years to go, you know? <laughs> you know <Adrian? laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Um, so, oh, yeah. I was, I was going to say, so, uh, you know, you, so you wrote in, uh, quite a few books. How did, yeah. uh, you know, with John A. Lights and, uh, you know, Gene Barella, you know, Gene Barello, how did that, uh, you know, how did you enter any, make an encounter with them guys. And well, that's a good, very good question. So when I was, when I was, uh, we, we, when I finished writing Bessa, we had a, um, we had a, a movie uh, script that was ready to go. Mm -hmm. And actually we did hire Chaz Palminteri and his son uh, to be the stars of, of the movie. Uh, financial problems ensued. Uh, I had to wind up suing a producer and getting the money back. But anyway, um, somehow I got to a light for a part in the movie and the movie didn't happen. It's still, it's still available uh, in script form and we're still pushing for it. Um, but, uh, that's how I met John. We became sort of friendly and, um, he asked me to write this book. I gotta be honest with you. It's not my favorite book. How come? I, I guess my heart's not in it. I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, he and I have, not talked in months and months and months. Um, I didn't make a penny on the book. 
which is not what I do for my writing books anyway. Uh, you're not going to make money writing books unless you're Dan Brown or someone like that, uh, James Patterson. Um, there's any money to be made in the publishing business is to be made if you're a big time publisher, a big time guy, author, or you make a movie. So one, one of my books called Intercession is being uh, touted right now. It's in production, right? It's in development right now uh, for a script. And I should have the script in a couple of days. And then we're going to push that with uh, either, a, either a feature film or a, um, uh, not a podcast, a, a serial. Mm -hmm. So Intercession is probably my bestseller, uh, as is Bessa. Bessa is equally uh, a bestseller. But uh, so after after he, he read Bessa, he loved it. Uh, I'm talking about Johnny A. Light. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him on the telephone and in person uh, getting a lot of his stories. He's got a lot of bad publicity lately, John, and I'm sort of keeping my distance from him. Uh, the book has not done well, maybe because it wasn't well written. Listen, I don't know. I mean, I, if you're a medical doctor and you don't do a good job with a, with a patient, mm -hmm. you got to admit to yourself, I did a bad job with that patient. I'm admitting that on this book. It's not out of the 20 books that I've written. It's number 20. Mm -hmm. uh, the Girello book, however, uh, has gotten, has sold much, much better. Uh, Gene is a character. There's no murders in the book because he never killed anybody. But it gives you a, a, like a slice of life of a, of a Bonanno um, enforcer. And Gene's a crazy guy. He really is. I mean, I used to meet him on Thursdays in a particular restaurant that I frequent in New Jersey where I live. And he would come in there and we'd spend a couple of hours every Thursday going over all the things that he did. And the guy's got a hair trigger temper. He's got issues. And if he doesn't want to wind up back in jail, and I, I, I talk to him all the time. I probably talk to Gene by text once a day. And sometimes we get on the phone, but he's, he's got to, he's got to calm his ass down at 38 years old. You know, if you, if you want to go back in jail, then do what you're doing. You know, he's not doing anything wrong to my knowledge. He's living in Florida. He was thrown out of New York. The judge said, get out of here. Um, and he's just got to calm down a little bit and, and put his nose to the grindstone. It's very hard, Adrian, when you're making that kind of money and not working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going and threatening people, extortion, <clears throat> gambling. You're grabbing a guy by his face, punching his head in, hitting him with a baseball bat, which are all the things that uh, that Gene Barello did, and a like to some degree. Uh, and if you're selling drugs and you're selling stolen property, uh, it's so much easier than getting up and doing a nine to fiver. Again, yeah. uh, De Niro uh, had it. Well, it was not De Niro. De Niro de depicted the uh, the guy, but uh, Chaz wrote it perfectly. The real hero is the guy who gets up and goes to work every morning. You know. Yeah. So, what, so what, now, I was going to ask you what was uh, some 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 major things that he did in that book. I guess that you not giving out the book, you know what I mean? But like, uh, you know, that he the stories that he did or went through, you know, that you don't mind talking about. Oh, he's insane. I mean, they, he and another guy went and they robbed uh, uh, they robbed a, a, a social club mm -hmm. owned by a, a made guy. <laughs> they actually waited for the made guy to come out of the social club, beat the shit out of him, stole his Rolex and some other jewelry he had and money, a big amount of money and took off. The next thing you know, he and this guy, his friend, are in the basement of a funeral home in Brooklyn, facing the family of the guy who they jumped, who they beat up. And it was, he, he said, I didn't know if I was coming out of that funeral home, the basement of that funeral home alive. And they saw, and, no, and they, and they said to him, you do this shit again in our neighborhoods around us, you're going to go. The only reason you're not going now is because we know your uncle. Uncle was dead, but we respect your uncle enough to let you get a pass. And who was his uncle? Uh, Fat Andy Ruggiano. Okay, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so, so listen to me. That being said, three months later, they did the same thing. Yeah, it's in the book. So, so if you're... If you have a death wish, you spit in the face of these guys who will kill you 
uh, and then go have a d- dish of spaghetti with that lobster I talked about before. They, they, <laughs> they have, they don't care. Yeah. So, so Gene, Gene needs to like, and I tell you something, I love the guy. He's a great guy. He's a great young man. Um, he just doesn't know the difference between right and wrong and doesn't know the difference between working and doing what he did for a living. You know, he was talking about how he used to fence stolen, uh, stolen goods, mm-hmm. breaking in broad daylight, guns out into a, uh, a Queens jewelry store. And the next thing you know, he's fencing the stuff with the Orthodox Jews, the Hasidic Jews on, on 40, 47th Street in Manhattan, getting the best uh, bang for his buck. And I said to him on a number of occasions, Jeannie, what, what, what happened to all the money? He said, we pissed it away. Cars, girls, flashy jewelry, name it. So, so as fast as it was coming, and that's how as fast as it was going. <laughs> so I recall his, he used to, I think he said he made between 30 and 40,000 a month. Now, back then, that's doctor and dentist money. I mean, doctors and dentists made that money. Cash. You make that much money in cash a month? I don't. No. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I did well in my career in the energy business, but and may, maybe I made that kind of money legitimately, but not cash. No. And no. I, no. And, <laughs> and and now and now you you you're saying, okay, what am I going to do now? Now that he's out of jail. The same thing with Johnny A. Light. He made Johnny made ten times that. Now what do you do? You can't open a pizzeria and make and make that. Because you're used to the high life. You used to drive in the fancy Mercedes and the, you know, and the sixty thousand dollar Rolexes. Now go and be a regular person. And that, to John A. Light's credit, uh, he does try to tell the younger people to stay out of the life. That's a platform he's using. Is yeah, he I like sincere? That. Is he sincere about it? I, I think he is. I think he is. I don't think. I think John is too smart to get back involved with the life. Yeah, I would but think so too. He's, He's scratching to make a living. I mean, listen, that guy, he had millions and millions of, of dollars. He, he owned legitimate businesses. He, he owned a, a parking garage, a parking businesses where they park at restaurants and so forth. Right. He made a lot of money. And, of course, he sold a lot of drugs, too. And, 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 and uh, he's a ferocious guy. I can remember one time we're having dinner and uh, having lunch. We met for lunch in a restaurant, a steakhouse in in. Uh, in um, Edgewater, New Jersey, pretty famous steakhouse. And I'm sitting there with him and I looked at him. I said, you know, John, I'm sitting here with you at any moment. They can come in and just blast away like they did with Anastasia. You're in a barber chair, but he's in a, and he said, he looked at me dead straight in the eye, serious as shit. And he said, they don't have, I don't have to worry about them. They have to worry about me. (laughs) I'm like, so he ain't worried about it. <laughs> no, I, he's not worried about it. I wasn't going to be worried about it. And we had a nice lunch and we, I'm still here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've met him a few times at my country club in Jersey. And uh, he, he's a classy guy, John. And he's a very, but he's getting a lot of bad publicity. They're saying he's a liar. He's a scumbag. One guy the other night, I'm watching a, a podcast. He said he's gay. He's a queer. I, I, I think that's nothing. There's nothing near that. No, I don't I, think so. I've seen, I've seen some of the ladies he's been with, and if he's gay, then I am. I, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't see. Yeah. That. What but, was uh, uh some major s- stories or something? You know, like how you talked about Gene. You know, what was some when you were writing his book that kind of stood out to you for John A. Light? You want John John's book or or Gene's no? Book? Yeah, John John's like what was something that stood out? To oh you? my God! One of the one of the things that. You know, he, he, he killed so many people. He really killed a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, he had, in one particular case, he told me the story that he had to go after this guy. And they're chasing this guy for weeks and weeks in Brooklyn or Queens. I don't remember. And they finally come up with him and he sees the guy. The guy runs up the stairs in his house, his mother's house. And Gene basically empties a pistol on him in his back. And then he left. I said, did he live? And Gene's, uh, John's answer to me was, I don't know. You don't know if he lived? You shot the guy up? No. I don't even know. Think about that for a second. 
Think about it. Th think about, you know, uh, uh, what else did uh, one of the things that John John told me was um, when he had to get somebody, when he had to do a hit and he knew the guy and it was just like, let's go out. They went out and had dinner and drinks and all this other shit. And they had a great time together. And at the end of the evening, he put two in his ear. I mean, that's cold. That's treachery. Yeah, that I mean, is. And that was the common denominator, the common word that both John and Gene used independent of each other with me interviewing them is that the life is treacherous. Jeez. Yeah. You know, one, guy, one guy bent down. I forgot. If, it might have been Gene that told me this. He was in the car with his friend. His friend was driving the car. The victim was sitting in the driver's seat, uh, in, the, in the passenger seat, the shotgun seat. And he said to him, uh, I forgot his name, Jimmy, go in the glove compartment. And as the guy bent down in his glove compartment, he shot him in the back of the head. His friend, his friend, best friend. He was ordered to do that. That's part of the life. Oh, I don't want to do that in my no. life. I, I would never want to do that in my life. Yeah, don't blame me, man. Me neither. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a quick story. My dad, who was uh, around it a lot, he was around it a lot, uh, but he wasn't involved with it. Um, but but um, he was. He told me a story. I, I told. I he was. He was old and not old. He was in his late fifties and he was sick from cancer and passing away. And I we were reminiscing about the old days and the restaurant. I said, Dad, you remember the guy, the old guy that used to come in and put me, I was in maybe four, three, and put me on the on the bar, and I used to sing Italian songs, and he used to give me money and take me to DeLillo's pastry shop and 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 get me uh, ices and cannolis. My father said, yeah. I said, what a great guy. He was always dressed in the gray, the gray suit and the, the gray shoes that matched and the hat. Who was that guy? My father looked at me, and he went, I said, so you had me at four years old hanging around with button men. What, what kind of people are you? I said, to him, Come on. I mean, my kids live in the, the my, my kids grew up in New Jersey. My grandchildren don't even know they're Italian anymore. Uh, and, 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 and I lived, I lived amongst these people and they were fabulous people. Fabulous. Yeah. I mean, kind of you know, talk about their personalities, you know, like how they can have, you know, such great personalities with you, but if you screw them over, oh, you might as well. Please. I mean, I, th there was a guy, Carmine Tremonti. I could talk about him because he's, he's long dead. He was uh, the head of the Lucchese family for a while. Uh, and he was a big, robust guy, uh, heavy set. He had steel gray eyes. His eyes would look right through you. And he was friends of friends of mine. And he was at their house one day and I was in college at that time. And I was doing the Marlon Brando impersonation because uh, it was the early seventies and, you know, Brando first came out with them. So they said to me, All right, Louis, go do the, go do the impersonation uh, for the Godfather for Carmine Tremonti. This guy was a ferocious guy. His hands were like twice my, so I go in the bathroom. I, take the toilet tissue and I put it in and I come up and say, oh, come on, no, I'm disrespecting me. And I'm doing all this stuff. And he's just staring at me. I don't know if he's laughing or if he thinks I'm ridiculing him. I mean, I fucking walk out of this place tomorrow. And then at the end of the thing, I said, you think you're the godfather? Well, here. And I take the toilet tissue out of my mouth and I go to hand it to him. He busts out laughing. And then all the guys around him, all his lieutenants all started, but, but nobody was laughing and he, he started laughing. I'm like 19 years old. I'm going to get my ass kicked. And, and I give him the toilet tissue and he goes, he goes bonkers. And he's, he's, he started to cough. He was laughing so hard. And then they wanted me to appear at one of their restaurants and do that on New Year's Eve. Luckily, I had plans to go to London to do a TV thing. Because uh, I was a, I was in broadcasting in school as well as business, and I, I, I had to turn it down. Uh, and then they never asked me again. And thank God, because I really didn't want. I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want to do that shit either. But that's I can't a true you story. That. That's a true story. And loving people, they love their families. They love their friends. I mean, I could tell you, I was around them for many years. If I had a problem with somebody, I, I feel sorry for that person. Because I wouldn't even go back and tell them I was having a problem. Because 
I was around them. You can't do that. So think about it if you're with them and you have a problem with somebody, a next door neighbor or something. I mean, they don't go for that, but they're loving, wonderful people. I mean, so was Albert Anastasia, the biggest killer in the world. You know Roseanne Scotto on Channel 5? I don't think I do. Are you in New York? Where are you? No, I'm in Nebraska, man. <laughs> oh, I'm in Nebraska. Well, you better you know. So anyway, uh, she's been on Channel 5 for 30 years. Albert Anastasia was her great uncle. Mm-hmm. And she's been a great news reporter here in New York City for, uh, it's got to be 30 years, maybe more. Um, and she's a wonderful family, a w- wife, mother, and broadcaster. Her uncle was the biggest killer in, uh, in, in, in the history of the mafia. <laughs> isn't that isn't that crazy? You just crazy. never know who you're related to. I mean, it doesn't crazy. mean that that doesn't mean who that's going to be you. You know, oh, I, mean, I was so. thinking about doing a book. Uh, it got into my head, and the book is not going to be written. But I wanted to um, write a book about Lucky Luciano when he was a child, because he came to this country from La Cara Frida, Sicily, when he was eight years old, and uh, I wanted to know what kind of kid he was. How old was he from zero to eight? How was he as a person from zero to eight years old? That's what I wanted to know. So I started doing some research. I read a few books that were written about him, and there's very little said about Sicily. So I contacted a family in my town. First of all, it's been too many years. Second of all, the family doesn't want to discuss it. They had photographs they wouldn't even share with me. They would show it to me on on. Uh, uh, Facebook, you know, what is that called? FaceTime? Yeah, yeah. But um, it, 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 they, they didn't want to really talk about it. And there was nobody left that would have first knowledge of him. So my idea of writing about how the criminal mind, the criminality of this person uh, came to being, uh, it, it was not meant to be that book. Yeah, that would have been a good one, though. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that, that's so. a good that's a good thought, you know, because it is weird. Yeah, yeah. Psychologically, you know, it's just, you know, when, when does that click or when does that switch to like, all right, you know, you know, living regular to, you know, going to murder people and shit. I yeah. mean, I, I was I was there once in in the town, and I, my cousin's husband, uh, who doesn't doesn't speak English, I asked him, um, what part of the island did the mafia still control? Uh, and he looked around, looked back at me in an Italian. He said, Tutti sola, the whole island. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. You know, you wouldn't know it. You know, they don't walk around with those John Gotti shirts and uh, yeah. they're dressed like you. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see, know the difference. They don't make a bella figura. They don't do that. So what would you say is the was kind of, you know, the downfall of the mafia when, you know, things really went south? Well, two things. Um, the RICO Act, mm-hmm. uh, which was necessary, and John Gotti. How come? Any, anybody I knew who knew John Gotti, and I knew quite a few people who were uh, capos to him, they had nothing but respect for the man. But well, one guy, an older man, said to me, and he was, a, he was a, a capo, he said to me, here he is signing autographs in a restaurant on Mulberry Street. And we're supposed to be a secret organization. He said, we're supposed to be a secret organization. He's signing autographs. He's on the cover of Time magazine. So they didn't like that. But because he was the boss, they respected it. Listen, I did business with... Uh, with um, as I was in the, I'm still in the energy business somewhat. I did business with uh, Castellano's family. Okay. I did business with the Gambino family. I do business now with uh, another family uh, in, 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 in the Bronx who are terrific people. I still do business with them. Never a hint of impropriety. They never ask me to do anything illegal or unsorted uns- uh, or bad. And they're just business people. They're legitimate business people. What they do, other than the purview that I have, it's not my business. Right. Yeah, you don't want to know. <laughs> but no, but they're stand-up people. I've been to yeah. their restaurants. They're terrific. I mean, they treat you like family, and uh, that's all I can say. And then, uh, there's a lot to be said about that life because yeah. they do know how to. They do know how to how to um, how to make you feel as part of them. I don't want it as beyond that oh that's another thing that both john and gene said to me he said we never mess around with civilians 
So Adrian, you're a civilian. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to do with them. You don't rob and sell stuff to them, blah, blah, blah. But the minute you place a bet, you're no longer a civilian. Damn, all it takes is a bet. <laughs> if you don't pay your bill, you don't pay the VIG, you're no longer a civilian. I knew that from when my father was uh, was uh, was balled up with them. He, he, he had an issue with them when I was 10 years old. So so they love you, they love you, they love you. The minute you step over the line, you're no longer a civilian. You're, you're part of their business. Yeah. And then all bets are off. And all bets are know. off. You know, all bets are off. They're not going to go like the Russians and kill your children. But you're fucked. You're, you're going to get screwed. They're going to get you. Yeah. And that's something that me and you don't want to be around. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. So, yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's pretty much all I had to cover, you know, so I'll well, wrap it up. You. And uh, where, where can the people find your books? Thank you. They could find them, of course, on Amazon and, and, and they could find it on uh, uh, I have a new website, Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, Romano, R-O-M-A-N-O, author.com. Uh, I just had all my book covers redone. I'm doing a major national uh, exposure on me now. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that. They could, you know, it's also on Amazon and all the places where you buy books, Barnes and Noble. I do Barnes and Noble readings all the time. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Adrian, I appreciate you. You're a nice young man. Yeah, thank you, man. And don't do any bets. <laughs> well, what'd you think? Lewis has got a pretty interesting story. He was around a lot of guys. Please comment a key takeaway that you got from this video. Also, please don't forget to hit subscribe if you want to get more like this. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested in buying any of Lewis's books. Also, if you want to support me, I'll put a link in the description. I got merch, I got t-shirts, hoodies, sweats. Lewis is also going to be in the documentary that I've been working on about the American Mafia, which is going to be a documentary series. Each episode is about a different crime family. So that's another reason to hit subscribe so you can be the first to get that when it comes out. And one more thing, I'll put a playlist of all my other Mafia interviews that I've done and you can check them out. Thanks again for watching.